that time of year thou mayst in me behold when yellow leaves, or none or few, do hang upon those boughs which shake against the cold, bare ruined choirs where late the sweet birds sang. In me thou seest the twilight of such day as after sunset fadeth in the west, which by and by black night doth take away, death's second self that seals up all in rest. In me thou seest the glowing of such fire that on the ashes of his youth doth lie, as the deathbed whereon it must expire, consumed with that which it was nourished by. This thou perceivest, which makes thy love more strong, to love that well which thou must leave ere long. It is extraordinary, that sonnet, isn't it? It's probably one of the most famous poems in the English language, but it comes up absolutely fresh as new paint every time you, you read it. I think that's the extraordinary thing about Shakespeare. He doesn't age at all, and he can write poetry of sheer beauty yes. with no special meaning yes. like sweet daffodils that come before the swallow dares Absolutely. and take the winds yes. of March with beauty. And yet he can write a thing like bare ruined choirs where late the sweet birds sang. Perfect. Can I ask you a very practical question, which is um, to tell us a bit about how you first came to poems. Were there poems in your family? Did your, were your parents readers of poems? Uh, my father was not terribly keen on poetry, mm. and what he liked was the rather heroic poetry yes. of uh, Kipling and yes. Henley. But mother was much more interested, yes. and she went to classes on literature, uh, WEA classes yes. in our little town of Keithley. Right. And it was she, I think, who encouraged me most yes. uh, to read poetry and, and later to write a little yes. bit. And of course, living there, being brought up there, that you were conscious that you had as sort of ghostly neighbours some of the greatest English writers just well, up on the moors. Emily Bronte, like me, was Yorkshire Irish. Her father came from County Down. And uh, they lived, of course, very close to where I lived as a boy. Uh, we looked across Keithley to House from my home. And I've always loved all the Brontes. Charlotte could always mix Irish magic with Yorkshire muck, and I think it's a very good mixture. I've always tried to have it myself. That's right. But uh, the poet I most adored and still do is Emily Bronte. Yes. Often rebuked, yet always back returning to those first feelings that were born with me and leaving busy chase of wealth and learning for idle dreams of things which cannot be. Today I will seek not the shadowy region, its unsustaining vastness waxes drear, and visions rising legion after legion bring the unreal world too strangely near. I'll walk where my own nature would be leading, it vexes me to choose another guide where the grey flocks in ferny glens are feeding, where the wild wind blows on the mountainside. What have those lonely mountains worth revealing? More glory and more grief than I can tell. The earth that wakes one human heart to feeling can centre both the worlds of heaven and hell. I love that because, especially the verse, I'd walk where my own nature would be leading. It vexes me to seek another guide, where the grey flocks in ferny glens are feeding, where the cold wind blows on the mountainside. That was exactly my part of Yorkshire, perfectly described by Emily. House has always been a favourite yes. place, both for me and my wife Edna, and I still find it unimaginable really that this tiny little village yeah. with this dank cold yes. parsonage should have produced two of the greatest yes. writers in the language right. Emily Bronte and Charlotte Bronte and I think that last few lines 
of Wuthering Heights are some of the most beautiful and evocative lines in English literature. I sought and soon discovered the three headstones on the slope next to the moor. The middle one grey and half buried in heath, Edgar Linton's only harmonised by the turf and moss creeping up its foot. Heathcliff's still bare. I lingered round them under the benign sky, watched the moths fluttering among the heath and harebells, listened to the soft wind breathing through the grass and wondered how anyone could ever imagine unquiet slumbers for the sleepers in that quiet earth. It is wonderful, that piece of writing, and one of, the, one of the things that it proves, which I think is a general truth, is that if you look at things very carefully and stay with the things themselves, yeah. you can't really go wrong. So it's the butterflies, it's the grass, it's the stone, it's the kind of actualities that she's so brilliant It at. is, but also you've got to have the right images and the right rhythm, sure. and this again is yes. what she gets absolutely perfectly. So there you are with parents who are both reading. Um, what about school? I was very lucky at school. I went to Bradford Grammar School yes. with a scholarship from Keithley. When I was at the junior school, yes. I used to cycle there and back. Yes. It took about 40 minutes, and it only took half an hour by bus. Uh, yes. <laughs> but when I was in the sixth form, although I was doing Latin and Greek, that yes. was my main subject, uh, we had a brilliant English teacher called... Uh, Leslie Shepherd, we yes. called him Giggling Gus because he was always uh, grinning and yes. laughing. And it was he who introduced me particularly to the later Yeats. Right. Uh, who was oh, interesting. Uh, Yeats is really yes. my passion. I think in 1922, I think the risk of a general war was much less than perhaps he felt it to be. But of course, there was fighting in Ireland and he was worried about it spreading. And uh, I think it is the greatest poem with an understanding of world affairs there's ever been. Turning and turning in the widening gar, the falcon cannot hear the falconer, things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world, the blood-dimmed tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Surely some revelation is at hand. Surely the second coming is at hand. The second coming. Hardly are those words out when a vast image out of spiritus mundi troubles my sight. Somewhere in sands of the desert, a shape with lion body and the head of a man, a gaze blank and pitiless as the sun, is moving its slow thighs, while all about it real shadows of the indignant desert birds. The darkness drops again, but now I know that 20 centuries of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare by a rocking cradle. And what rough beast its hour come round at last, slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. Can you remember whether your teacher in particular was telling you things about modernism? I mean, here he is giving you late Yeats. Did you feel that um, taking these new writers on board made you feel part of, was it part of being young? Was it part of the revolution of being young? Up to a point, I think, obviously in the sixth form, one was already beginning to worry about the possibility of another world yes, war. Uh, but most of the poets I was reading at the time, and even more when I got to Oxford, were full of happiness and vibrancy. Mm. Just remind me what year you went to Oxford in. Uh, I went to Oxford in 1936 uh, and Hitler entered the Rhineland yes. at that time. We had the Munich Agreement uh, in 1938 right. 
and fought the Oxford by-election on behalf of the master of my college, yes. uh, Sandy Lindsay, yes. who stood as a popular front candidate with support ranging from conservatives like Ted Heath, yes. who was at Balliol with me, uh, to communists like Abe Lazarus and myself and the leader of the Oxford local Labour Party, Lazarus was. But uh, inevitably at that time, one was more and more concerned with poetry which reflected the mood of the time. And of course, the shadow of war lay over us all. And you've presumably it, been very agitated by what was happening in Spain. Oh, very much. And uh, I mean, one of the chaps I most admired uh, was killed in Spain. He was John Cornford. And John volunteered to fight with the International Brigade and was killed early during the Spanish Civil War. The year probably I went up to Oxford and his girlfriend was called Margot Heinemann, and that poem is to her. And surprisingly, my daughter Jenny was taught by Margot Heinemann, who lived a, a full normal life uh, after John died. Heart of the heartless world, dear heart, the thought of you is the pain at my side the shadow that chills my view. The wind rises in the evening, reminds that autumn is near. I am afraid to lose you. I am afraid of my fear. On the last mile to Huesca, the last fence for our pride, think so kindly, dear, that I sense you at my side. And if bad luck should lay my strength into the shallow grave. Remember all the good you can. Don't forget my love. It's a very touching poem, isn't oh, it? Oh, I think it's extraordinary, mm -hmm. really. And he was one of the, I think, people who would have become a great writer yes. in later life. And uh, so many people I knew. I didn't know John. Um, but I came to know many of them later. Uh, a, a lot were actually killed either in the Spanish Civil War or in the uh, war that followed, the Second World War. Right. Dennis Healy joined up in 1940 as a sapper and fought through the war. After the North Africa campaign, he took part in the Allied landings at Anzio in Italy, where he was a beachmaster. The photograph he managed to take that morning has been reprinted many times. Like other politicians of his generation, Willie Whitelaw and Ted Heath, for instance, the war was to have a lasting impact on Dennis Healy. I did the whole of the Italian campaign and, and the North African campaign from Algiers to Tunis and then, or Oran to, to, to Tunis, and then from the south of Sicily to Trieste and the Austria and Lower Austria, Klagenfurt. And uh, I think the war made an impact on everybody involved, whether they went into politics or poetry or whatever. Uh, and uh, certainly the wartime generation of politicians, of whom Willie is a good example, was one, uh, had this feeling, and Ted Heath too, you see. And basically being in a war, uh, especially in the fighting part of a war, taught you that we all depend on one another uh, as individuals and also the army depends on the navy and the air force and vice versa so that interdependence is a great thing you're taught by war and that's very very important in my view in politics but death i'm afraid was part of our lives and some of my best friends were killed in the war frank thompson I knew very slightly because he and I met uh, when we were seeing the warden of Merton College, Oxford, where I think he, like me, had been offered some sort of scholarship. But he was the boyfriend of a girl who was a great friend of mine at Oxford, but not a girlfriend, uh, Iris Murdoch, of course, the great novelist. And. Uh, I think that was one of the, the great tragedy of her life, it was really when he was killed at the end of the war in Bulgaria. 
As one who, gazing at a vista of beauty, sees the clouds close in, and turns his back in sorrow, hearing the thunder clouds begin, so we whose life was all before us, our hearts with sunlight filled, left in the hills our books and flowers, descended and were killed. Right on the stones, no words of sadness, only the gladness due that we, who asked the most of living, knew how to give it to. It's a very, very good thing to hear that poem again, because I don't think it is a very well-known poem. No, it isn't. That. It's not in most anthologies, right. surprisingly. Though I think it's very much the poem of a man who volunteered for very dangerous work. He was a British agent in enemy country, you see, in Bul Bulgaria, and was captured and shot by the Germans uh, towards the end of the war. And for Iris, of course, it was the great tragedy, I think, of her life. With the fighting over, Dennis Healy returned to Britain to a political career and also to marriage. Edna Healy had a distinguished career herself as a writer and is currently working on her memoirs. They've been together now for 60 years. You two met each other at Oxford when yes, you were both... Yes, but she had, a, was it 63 boyfriends? No, I don't I remember. Didn't. I didn't. You had Harold Lied Lydell and Leo. Yes. At least. Yeah. <laughs> And yes. I, I, my girlfriend lived still in Yorkshire in yes. those days, the one I had. And I didn't really have any girlfriends at Oxford. Uh, Matilda Shaw was very keen on me. Do you remember her? Yeah, I remember her, yeah. And who was the other one? Oh, Mary from Cornwall. What was her name? I have to be careful how you say this, because she's probably going to be watching this programme. She'll be <laughs> yeah. outraged that you've forgotten. <laughs> yes, no, no, she came to teach in Keithley, where I live, yes. after the war. Yes. We started courting then, but we decided it was wiser to wait till the war was over, because uh, yes. I was uh, abroad for three years. All his life, Dennis Healy has had a passion for photography. Many collections of his pictures, taken all over the world, have been published. There are fascinating shots of statesmen and key figures in the Labour Party's history, like Nye Bevan and Hugh Gateschool. What I was interested in seeing, though, were the family snaps. This is the, one of the earlier ones, yes. when Edna and I were uh, auditioning for the above Chamonix. Music. Yes, well, <laughs> and I took it with an uh, automatic, uh, you know, Oh, yes, he, really, so, yes. so I had to plant it on a stone below, unfortunately. Yes. And then he sure, says, Mississippi nice. 1, Mississippi 2, it's Mississippi 3, and you rush into That's right. And that's one of Edna and me by our little well, me holding my stomach in by <laughs> tremendous effort. And me not holding mine in. <laughs> yes. Well, you're all right. You, you wear these loose gowns. <laughs> And then this is a lovely one I like because it I reminds me of the rivers of the windfall all... light. Yes. This is our son Tim oh, and our daughter nice. Jenny. Oh, nice. And Jenny's now 54 and Tim's 53. And this is the forest uh, of Dean. That's the forest of Dean, yeah. yes. Those are trees that we watched being planted. Right. In my childhood, our botany master had advised on their planting. And we walked along and we said, won't it be marvellous when we're old and we come here and there'll be a forest? And they are. That's a very, very good story, I think. It's like a poem by Hardy, isn't it? Yes, exactly. Meeting yourself. Yes. Quite. Along the road. Yes. There's a poem I would very much like you to read by R.S. Thomas, oh, I, which yeah, I, no, I know yeah. is a great favourite of yours. No, I love this poem. It's. Uh... Can you read it without crying? Yes, I think so. <laughs> no, I, you couldn't I listen couldn't. to it without crying. No, no. You, no. no it's the most beautiful poem by the Welsh poet R. S. Thomas, who was could be very distant and withdrawn, but he wrote this beautiful poem after his wife Miriam died about a marriage. We met under a shower of bird notes. Fifty years passed. Love's moment in a world in servitude to time. 
She was young. I kissed with my eyes closed and opened them on her wrinkles. Come, said Death, choosing her as his partner for the last dance. And she, who in life had done everything with a bird's grace, opened her bill now for the shedding of one sigh no heavier than a feather. Beautiful, isn't it? I, I've always regarded my interest in the arts and music, painting and poetry particularly, uh, as Im important, at least as important, yes. as um, politics. Because if you're only interested in politics, you tend to develop a horny carapace and become totally insensitive to other things. Hinterland, literally, of course, is the back of a landscape, something behind the other land. But Edna used it about human beings having something at the back of their normal personality, which sometimes is more important to them than what other people see. And uh, I think it's a wonderful word to use in that sense. I've pinched it from her. I wondered whether I could ask you a very simple sounding question, which is, do you turn to it for comfort or do you turn to it more for stimulation and thoughtfulness and...? I turn to it for love. For love, <laughs> yes. Absolutely, that's yes. the thing, really. Yes. I mean, uh, if you take Auden, uh, I'm not passionately keen on his political poetry, um, but I think his non-political poetry yes. is absolutely magnificent. Lay your sleeping head, my love, human on my faithless arm. Time and fevers burn away individual beauty from thoughtful children, and the grave proves the child ephemeral. But in my arms till break of day, let the living creature lie, mortal, guilty, but to me, the entirely beautiful. Beauty, midnight, Vision dies. Let the winds of dawn that blow softly round your dreaming head such a day of sweetness show I and knocking heart may bless. Find the mortal world enough. Noons of dryness see you fed by the involuntary powers. Nights of insult let you pass, watched by every human love. One of the particularly fascinating things about this poem, I, I, I think now, is that um, you don't have to know very much about Alden these days to know that he was gay. It's a, a love poem which is going to be there f for all time. And the reason, one of the reasons why that's uh, so, well there are so many, but one of the reasons I think is that it is absolutely brilliant at balancing um, terrific, unhindered tenderness with realism about how the world is, human, i.e. fallible, on my faithless arm. Uh, he knows perfectly well writing the poem that the, this beautiful time that they're having together, this moment of tenderness, is a kind of escape from the reality, yeah. if you like. Um, but the reality surrounds them all uh, uh, very, very visibly, um, which prevents it seeming like an escapist poem. I think it is a perfect little poem, and that, of course, is written to a boyfriend, but it's a most beautiful poem, I think. Do you think there's some sense in which um, poems act for you as prayers might act for an orthodoxly religious person? I think so. I mean, you don't worry about death very much until you're over 40. And you don't worry when you're over 75, <laughs> as I am now, 11 years over. But um, some of the greatest poems really have been written with the thought of death in mind. And of course, people died so much younger, probably the average age was under 60 uh, in the Elizabethan time. And even the beginning of the 20th century, it was three score years and ten, so that people were deeply conscious of the possibility of dying. 
at any moment of any cause and wrote a lot of poetry about it. Because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. The carriage held but just ourselves and immortality. We slowly drove, he knew no haste, and I had put away my labour and my leisure too for his civility. We passed the school where children played, their lessons scarcely done. We passed the fields of gazing grain, we passed the setting sun. We paused before a house that seemed a swelling of the ground. The roof was scarcely visible, the cornice but a mound. Since then, tis centuries, but each feels shorter than the day I first surmised the horses heads were toward eternity. I think one of the striking things looking through the poems that you that you have loved all your life mm. is that things to do with the, the end of life, um, with old age in particular, are there right from the beginning? Well, I think great poetry encapsulates human feeling, especially feeling of human beings as human beings, love particularly, uh, better than painting or music. Music isn't about things, it is a thing in itself. Uh, but uh, I've always found that poetry enriches my life enormously and, as I say, can it encapsulate your feeling in a way nothing else quite does. I take a lot in my head anyway, but a desert island where you're not really thinking about politics, I think in many ways Yeats's last poem practically was the one that is engraved on his tombstone outside Sligo. Cast a cold eye on life, on death, horsemen pass by. <laughs> 